Hey guys, I'm back. I know I said I was like gonna go live for another 30 minutes. I just wanted to like eat something real quick because I sometimes when I go live I start to get like hungry and I'll get a headache <clears throat> and uh, that's low blood sugar, you know what I mean? So um, I think the last question I left off on was um, can you do fully nourished on a budget? And uh, the question, the answer to that question was totally yeah. Okay, so I would love to hear your thoughts on whey protein powder. Yes, the last live will be there. Sorry, I'm gonna answer this question. The last live will be there for 24 hours and I was able to save it. Woo -woo. So I have like a couple lives gonna be going up on YouTube. I think I haven't uploaded the past like three weeks of lives on YouTube. So there's gonna be quite a few lives going up on YouTube's, uh, on YouTube's, on YouTube today. Waking up with headaches. So Ambie, I was, you know, like you, in your last live, you were saying you're constantly hungry. You are having testosterone, like oily scalp. I'm wondering, if you're not getting enough protein because if you're not getting enough protein and you're waking up with headaches maybe your blood sugar is imbalanced and that's why you're so hungry all the time so I would maybe try to experiment with a little bit more protein and see how you feel because if you're waking up with headaches you're feeling hungry all the time it could be that you're eating maybe too many carbs for your body and you need a little bit more protein to balance them out but Nancy is saying I would love to hear your thoughts on whey protein powder and whey protein powder is one of those things where it's very unique to the individual we have to keep in mind that the two proteins in milk have very specific purposes. Whey is one of the proteins in milk and casein is the other protein. Whey is more stimulatory and it does um, have, it can turn into, it, it's very rich in L-tryptophan and L-tryptophan can turn into serotonin, which can sometimes make people depressed or make people have gut issues. And so sometimes people don't do as well on whey as they do on casein, but overall, if you can't get enough protein from um, whole food sources like eggs, shellfish, white fish, um, meats, um, milk, like I prefer honestly just a glass of, of milk over a, a protein powder, it's just less processed. Um, but if you can't get enough protein from those sources, from collagen powder, then um, at that point, then maybe a whey or a casein is a better option. But I would always make sure it's grass fed. I like the brand Naked Whey or Naked uh, Casein and they are um, pretty high quality. I'm definitely not getting enough protein. I've always struggled with that. Well, at that point, sometimes a protein powder can be helpful because it'll pack you 20 to 25 grams of protein in a sitting and it helps you kind of get your protein up throughout the day and then you can kind of start to make a little bit more protein. But sometimes protein is really where women are going wrong and it's really affecting like how they feel. Girl, the damn calm creamsicle is ruining my life. Can't get enough. I know, it's so good. It really is. It's like it's so delicious. It's like orange cream. Is bacillus coagulin spore based? I found that Thorn carries the probiotic based in Canada. Good for SIBO. It really depends. I think that the, uh, the best route to go with probiotics is to really experiment a little bit. So if... um you can ask them if it's spore based a lot of times you know any strain can be made spore based or most can be made spore based so ask them if it's spore based um if you do well on bacillus coagulans then you can do maybe two or three bottles of it but if you don't do well with it then then you don't do well with it and it's just kind of one of those things where it's hard to know how an individual is going to react to a specific strain of probiotics I love how you remember my questions from your previous lives because I don't shut up. <laughs> no, I just remember like people's cases. Like it's like my my gifting slash curse um, that I just remember like everyone's problems and I'm always worrying about everybody. Like I'm always stressing about like, is everyone doing okay? Are my clients doing okay? Like I hope everything's going okay. <laughs> I, I really do care about you guys and care about your health. Um, I'm not sure if you got this question in the last slide, but what do you think of chicken liver pate? I pretty much said like, ew, but I also said like, if it's good, I, well, before you said chicken liver brulee, and I was like, that is disgusting, but pate makes it a little bit more tolerable. I think pate is a great way to get liver in. It's delicious. You never want to get enough of it, and, um, it, it can help you get, um, those nutrients in quite easily, and you can make your own too if you want to, um, and p pack a lot of nutrients in it. Thoughts on bone broth protein powders such as Dr. Axe? 
you know, I think it's kind of a scam, honestly. Like, I'm just like, meh, you're not really getting the benefits of bone broth necessarily from bone broth protein. Plus, I think Dr. X puts, like, all this junk, like, xanthan gum, guar gum. I've had, like, multiple clients come to me. They're taking his his protein powder, thinking, like, they're doing such a, something so great for themselves. They're they're spending like $50 a month on it and then we are looking at those ingredients and wondering why they sell all these gut issues and it has guar gum in it and I'm like <laughs> gross guar gum is not um good for your gut I just want everyone to let everyone know that is struggling with weight loss and doing FN to stick it out. I'm seeing significant weight loss and generally feeling happier. If it works, uh, it works if you stick it out. Thank you. Thank you for that. I know it's so hard because we're so used to these, like, I want to see results instantly. And it's really hard because a lot of us go into, go into programs or things with expectations, right? Like, I want to lose weight. And you might be seeing, like, better energy, feeling overall better, your hair's growing, you're sleeping better but because you went in, in with it the expectation I want to lose weight if you're not seeing that then you just feel like it's a failure when in reality you're seeing so many other things in your life improve yet because you're focused on that only one thing you're really taking away from the fact that your body is changing before your eyes so it's just one of those things where um, it's not a weight loss program and that's why I said like you know I'm not gonna promise you guys weight loss however most women are gonna lose weight eventually if they just start working on their metabolism. Sorry, I gotta let my dog out of my office. He uh, is quite the uh, exploratory guy. He uh, is still a puppy and he's very difficult. He is really challenging me in all of the, the best and worst ways. Okay, uh, yeah, cause it's been six weeks for you. That's crazy on Fully Nourished. Weight loss will happen when your body is safe, right? Yeah, so you have to remember, guys, and I've talked about this. See, he wants back in. Um, you have to remember that your body has to actually expend energy to store fat. So it takes more energy to burn for your cells and store things as fat. Think of it as like you're a doomsday prepper, right? You're eating, you're feeding your family, but you're also cooking food to store up for the future. That's like extra work, right? Like you're not just gonna like um, be cooking for your family and yourself. You're also cooking for your future to put in your storehouse for, for the apocalypse. That is a lot of extra work and that's what your body is doing when it's storing fat. So your body does not wanna expend extra energy storing fat that's unnecessary think of it that way like your body truly does not want to expend a bunch of energy storing as fat and it takes more energy not less and so weight loss does happen when you're safe because your body's finally like yes I don't have to store fat I can just burn it and I don't have to actually expend energy to store it so yes your body needs to feel safe and you also need to limit stressors so stress hormones need to be down and the biggest way that we can lower stress hormones is with food eating at a frequent a consistent way in a, in a specific way right I have you guys eating saturated fats not polyunsaturated fats I have you guys eating plenty of really whole food animal based protein sources and carbohydrates from the right sources which is fruits and fruits and then properly prepared grains so you're getting lots of easy to absorb and digest nutrients. Your body's not having to work very hard to extract those nutrients from like tons of cruciferous vegetables and tons of leafy greens. And your body's really getting nutrients very quickly, which is making it feel safe a lot faster. I missed the answer last live. A1C 8.0, um, high HFLC 5.3 to now 6.0 after adding roots and fruits, feeling fuzzy, foggy, used to feel very good, liver parasites. Unfortunately, if you've been on a low carb diet, keep in mind that there are studies coming out every day now that we kill off on a low carb diet. Sometimes you permanently kill off strains of bacteria that were helping you digest carbohydrates and keeping your metabolism stable. You also can create hepatic or liver insulin resistance and um, you're pretty much what that means scientifically is you're more insulin resistant than you were before. <laughs> you a low carb makes us insulin resistant because it's forcing the body to burn a fuel it doesn't really want to burn and then it it now needs to be retaught how to burn sugar properly and it usually it destroys a lot of processes in the process. So a lot of times it's as simple as getting the body back to burning glucose properly, um, but it could be a lot of gut issues because low carb tends to create a lot of gut issues um, because it kills off specific strains of, of bacteria. Sometimes it makes them go completely extinct. 
As for buying milk, are we looking for grass-fed organic? Tried goat milk and it did not go well. My boyfriend has the same problem drinking milk. Wonder what kind would be best. Not everyone does well on milk, especially if you have just so many disrupt, like a very disrupted gut, like it can take some time. Um, I usually look for grass-fed organic um, and I look for non-homogenized. Um, I personally can get my hands on raw milk, so that's what I purchase, but not everyone can or not everyone's comfortable with raw milk and that's totally fine. It's really a personal preference. So yeah, you're just looking for something that's pasture raised and preferably organic if possible. Like there's not a bunch of pesticides sprayed on, on, on their food or on them. Um, if, if the cows are not organic, unfortunately they can be um, pumped full of antibiotics and you don't want that. So um, yeah, you're looking for cows that ate their native diet, which is grass, and you're looking for preferably low pesticides. But yeah, I hate goat milk. I think it's disgusting. Like I really truly think it's like, like ugh. even just thinking about it makes me want to barf. Like it's so gross to me, unfortunately. Thoughts on light therapy for hormonal acne? Um, I think it be a, can be a helpful complement. I don't think it's going to fix all of the issues. But I think it can help in conjunction with getting to the root cause of what's driving the acne. Any tips for getting motivated for an early morning routine? I have a sleep in issue. Um, I think we can all have sleep in issues, especially if we don't prepare our day the night before. So I'm like a very like organized type A, like very person. So for me, I like to prepare my day like the night before which is might be like very neurotic I don't know it depends on how you look at it but I like to like set myself up for success so for example like I like to get everything out for like my morning drink that's gonna be like lemon and apple cider vinegar and honey you know get it on the counter so that when I like all I have to do is turn on the water to boil while I'm feeding the dog um, and then I can make my elixir really quickly um, I also wind down pretty early so I start to wind down around 9 p.m. try to get to bed by 10 p.m. so that when I, you know, that eight hour mark rolls around, I know it's going to be 6am. Because if you know you need X amount, amount of hours of sleep, you need to make sure you prepare the night before like, okay, I need to make sure I get this amount of hours of sleep. If I want to wake up at 6am, I need to get it to bed by 10pm to get eight hours of sleep, you know, so, so don't be like, stupid in the way that I don't mean that rude I just mean like don't be like uh we sometimes like set ourselves unrealistic expectations where it's like I'm gonna wake up at 6 a.m but you know you need eight hours of sleep and you go to bed at midnight like you're not gonna wake up at 6 a.m like just get that through your head like you're just not gonna happen so prepare yourself for success and start going a little lower like um, easing into it. So what I mean is like if you wake up right now at 10 a.m. and you want to wake up at 8 a.m. you probably shouldn't be like okay I'm gonna just wake up at 8 a.m. tomorrow. You should maybe start at 9 30, 9 o'clock, 8 30, and then 8 o'clock and then like slowly work up or just have kids because they'll make you wake up early regardless. Uh, low C peptide test, is that part of unbalanced blood sugar? Um, it can be. It's really hard for me to like, when it's one specific thing, I'm really just speculating at that point. Like I need to know what's going on with someone, um, their other testing, that type of thing. Insulin hormone went from 220 to 7.7 .7, though. Oh, if it's improving, then that's a good thing. Um, I, I thought you were saying like it's not a good thing. Um, but no, that's great if your insulin went lower. I'm consuming homogenized milk. It's organic though. Is that okay? So, so hard to find homogenized milk that isn't whole in Canada. Yeah, I don't think that's a problem. If, as long as it doesn't make you like super uber bloated and you feel fine, I wouldn't stress about it. Really, the biggest thing with homogenized milk is just that the lactoferrin is gone, which is helpful for binding to iron and things like that. Um, so if you have acne and stuff, like homogenized milk can sometimes be, or non-homogenized can sometimes be a little better, but it's not like gonna kill you or anything like that. How do you add fats and protein when you can't eat nuts, avocado, coconut, dairy? Is there a gentle protein powder you recommend to gain weight? Um, well, first of all, ask yourself why you can't eat those things. Um, is it is it allergies? Because dairy a lot of times is cut out because food sensitivity test says something or people are eating dairy because they have like a dairy phobia and it needs to be revisited a lot of the times. That's what I do with my clients. A lot of times the dairy wasn't the problem. It was all the other irritants that were the problem because dairy is one of the high most high quality sources of protein um, on the planet. But at that point, if you're truly can't eat those things I mean like I'm not a big fan of nuts or avocado in general for women anyways because um, just the sources of fats um, but 
you know, I, I really, this is why, like, I, I don't know your, your, I don't know your history, but I'm, like, worried that you're maybe basing that on a food sensitivity test, which is just big bull of bollocks, like, it's just, um, they're not accurate, and, uh, but if it's, like, you truly have sensitivities, then why do you have sensitivities to those things? What's going on with your immune system? Where's your thyroid at? Um, where's your gut health? Why? Why? Because food sensitivities should not last forever. Like, if you can't eat them at this point in time, that's fine. Eat around them. Do collagen for protein. Um, you can do, I really hate plant-based protein powders. I think they wreck gut health, so that's why I prefer, like, a whey or a beef uh, base protein powder like you could do a beef if you are trying to do dairy free like a bovine beef protein um, or an egg white protein or um, something like that but uh, collagen tends to be the best source and gelatin bone broth those are ways you can add protein in but yeah you want to get to the roots of that because um, I always ask people that are cutting out dairy why are you cutting out dairy a lot of times they're like oh it's inflammatory or like my food sensitivity test said I was allergic to dairy and at that point I'm just like no um, because uh, a lot of times they're cutting a, a very nutrient dense food and where are you getting those nutrients the vitamins a d e and k and that type of thing so um and then there's also a lot of times when people are on super restrictive diets they're really loading up on leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables which are super gut irritating and so it's not really allowing the gut to heal at all it's just continuing this like irritation this constant irritation this constant feeding of bacteria and that's why food sensitivities and food allergies are not healing it's just because there's constant Constant irritation um, being uh, I guess put on the gut yeah I'm going to bed at like midnight I'm having trouble sleeping since stopping progesterone cream first half of my cycle yeah I remember you saying that um, yeah I would I would just start working on going to bed a little earlier and a little earlier and a little earlier you know what I mean just like starting to, to work on it Avoiding polyunsaturated fats altogether since FN, it has helped stop my, uh, your really, really heavy, I can't remember if you said you had heavy cramping or heavy periods or both. Um, should they still be avoided on salads when dealing with inflammation? Yeah, well, it's one of, uh, and menagerie, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't say it and that's why I skipped over the word. Um, so polyunsaturated fats should just kind of try to be avoided as much as possible you shouldn't be like afraid of them necessary but necessarily but uh, I think that if you if it's working for you to avoid them then it's probably best to avoid them more often than not and when it comes to salads what are you eating are you eating like canola and soybean oil at that point maybe carry like some primal kitchen foods or some type of um, homemade dressing in your purse with you like if you know you're gonna go out for salads all the time that's something that you would want to do. Tools to help you go back to sleep after waking up during the night. Um, balanced blood sugar. A lot of women are just hungry. They're not eating enough throughout the day and they're waking up with hunger. And so just eating a snack that has some carbs and some fat, like half a sweet potato with some coconut butter or um, ghee um, or doing like some berries and cream or um, doing like some bone broth and some fruit. Just something that has some, some protein and fat in it um, to get back to bed is usually the way to go. Or if the, if the mind is racing, then doing something to shut the brain off, like um, uh, journaling or something like that. What's the best source of fats? Um, I wouldn't say like the best source of fats, but I prefer like coconut oil, grass-fed butter, ghee, that type of thing. Thinking of doing a parasite cleanse for added health since I'm working on my liver as a goal, scram the best one as the label says or more caps. Um, I, yeah, I, when it comes to scram, I just use as the label says, keep in mind when you do any type of pathogen cleanse, you always need to take a binder as well. You should never do any type of bacteria, fungus, parasite cleanse unless you're taking a binder um, at night to bind to any of the toxins that are being given off. Sorry, I meant more so olive or avocado oil. Oh yeah, no. If you're just having a little olive or avocado oil on your salad, I don't think it's a problem. As long as it's like not canola or soybean, I it's probably fine. After a review of my blood work, I was prescribed Synthroid. Synthroid does Synthroid cause weight gain? It totally can because it can just kind of stress the body out. It's it it's your body still has to convert T4 into T3, and a lot of times it's uh, your body can't do that, and that's the problem in the first place. Is kombucha good for hormonal imbalance? Um, I wouldn't say it's good or not. I'm neutral on it, but I wouldn't like chug it. 
um, cause I don't think it's not, it's going to do much good. What is your advice with someone with a bad relationship with food? Um, I think the ba best advice is learn about your food. I don't know if, I know there's probably a lot of fully nourished students in this live or a couple. Would you say that it helped with your relationship with food? Um, just learning about the, your food and learning about what your food helps you with and how nutrient dense food can actually be medicine to the body. Um, I think that learning about your food is the best. I think right now, um, so many people are being taught to fear food. It's like all these influencers are on these uber restrictive diets telling other people that they need to cut carbs and they need to cut this and they need to cut that and it's just really really um overwhelming and it really creates this food fear and so we begin to think that food is just going to make us fat food is going to make us sick food is going to make us whatever it is and we need to really be empowered about our food that our food could actually be our greatest friend and it could actually be the thing that helps us lower our stress and get our hormones balanced but we have to learn about our food so uh you know my program fully nourished really teaches you about your food and that's why i like really don't want to create any food fear in women i want them to actually see their food as a tool and be super empowered with their food. What binder do I recommend? Um, I, re I recommend Quicksilver's binder um, or um, uh, what else do I recommend? Or like a, just a regular activated charcoal. I like one that's going to kind of like be a fiber in a sense. Um, I uh, The two that I love the most are going to be Quicksilver's and Pectisol C. What is your take on Whole30? Um, it's going to create a worse relationship with food. It creates a lot of food fear, unfortunately. I'm not a big fan of it. Can you heal PCOS with a plant-based diet? Um, in my opinion, no. Hormone balance or gut infections first. I have high cortisol and gut dysbiosis postpartum. It depends on where the, what the hormone imbalance are. I think sometimes they have to be worked on conjunctively, so together. Um, but you have to kind of like have someone that's very strategic about what, what they're doing with you because, of course, it could get really overwhelming very quickly. But the gut and the hormones are intimately connected, so you can't really work on one without working on the other in a sense. A lot of times what I do when someone has bad gut dysbiosis and hormonal imbalance is I'm looking at what type of hormonal imbalance. So a lot of times the hormonal imbalance is driven by stress, which a lot of times can be... Um, there can be a lot of progress made with that just by getting someone eating frequently. That also works on gut motility and lowering that stress can actually help with gut dysbiosis and then we'll work on the gut conjunctively with you know working on food frequency. So a lot of times you can do both and you should do both but sometimes one does need to be addressed before the other. I've been on the pill for years. What to expect when going off of it? Um, it just kind of depends. Keep in mind what it's done. Like you just have to understand that my cycle has been shut off for how many years. It's gonna take a while for my body to, um, you know, re I guess start the cycle. Um, so I would I would really look into the period repair manual by Lara Brighton and uh, Beyond the Pill by Dr. Jolene Brighton. She talks. They talk both a lot about what to expect, some some precautions to take, and things like that. Sugar addiction, how to, kick, how to kick it. You guys know how I feel about sugar addictions. They do not exist. Your body wants sugar because it is undernourished. What happens is we undernourish ourselves. We go on a yo-yo diet, whatever it is. We try to cut sugar, which is usually just very processed, calorie-dense foods. And then we expect our bodies to not crave it. Why? We're restricting the things that it needs. Every single cell in your body runs on sugar, on glucose. And so you want to get sugar from the right sources, root vegetables, fruits, an abundance of things like maple syrup, honey, coconut sugar. Um, never feeling restricted and nourishing your body every two to three hours with protein, carb, and fat really takes away the, the need to binge on sugar. Uh, it's not sugar that's the that's the problem. A lot of times it's us that the pro that's the problem. We restrict, restrict restrict, restrict until we binge. And if we're binging on sugar, sugar, we, we blame sugar, but a lot of times it's processed foods that we're binging on. And it's the calories that our body needs. I'm a college student on a tight budget, $50 a week for groceries. Sometimes I find it hard to buy enough high quality food. Any tips on how to make that amount work so I'm getting enough nourishment? Yeah, so at that point, you kind of want to get a little bit, I guess, creative. So you want to figure out what your schedule is like, what you need. So for example, like 
and you're gonna want to like buy in bulk and shop sales so if you're gonna prepare your breakfast for the whole week let's say you make a big quiche whatever right you're gonna try to get as many eggs as you can at the lowest price and make your breakfast for the whole week and and get that cost down so breakfast should cost you about $15 for the whole week or so because that would be about a third of your budget. And then lunches, what are you going to have for lunch every week? And a lot of times buying the same thing, I know it can get repetitive, but it can really save. So maybe like white rice and a crock pot chicken dish with some vegetables in it. You know what I mean? So you're really like, um, breaking it down into sections. So breakfast should cost about $15, lunch should cost about $15, um, dinner should cost about $15, and then, you know, pick something to do with snacks. So what fruit is in season, um, you know, or um, what can you get for like a low cost because there's an abundance of it? That would be the biggest thing. Um, look at Thrive Market as well. Thrive has a lot of nutrient dense foods. Um, and snack type foods at a lower cost. And if you are a low income, they will waive the membership fee for you. So that's kind of the strategy that I would use. I would also focus like carbohydrate wise, like really focus on getting either potatoes, uh, if you can, uh, sweet potatoes, if you can afford them, but a lot of times potatoes are cheaper. Um, and then uh, white rice is another one because it's just super cheap. And then you can always uh, look at uh, sales. So sh always just shop sales. Um, that's the biggest thing. And then um, like whatever is in, in season is probably going to be the cheapest. You're the best. I'm just so confused. Have been studying food and do eat freely, not scared, not for weight loss, just want to feel amazing as a goal. Yeah, no, I like it sounds like you're really working on your health and you're doing all the right things. But yeah, going back to the budget, you guys, it's really about doing the best you can with what you have. Don't feel like you have to shop everything organic either. Like really focus on getting the dirty dozen organic or just don't buy the foods on the on the dirty dozen list. Um, things like melons tend to be pretty cheap for fruit and you don't have to buy them organic. Um, so, you know, again, just really shop sales and learn about the seasonality of fruit and vegetables things that are in season are just much cheaper also ask your grocery stores sometimes they will actually throw out um, fruit and vegetables that are just like deformed they're not like acceptable for the produce aisle and you're like hey i would like to buy those things like um, um help me i'm poor you know and that's what i did um in in college i would really like say like hey uh, I would go to the grocery store that was local to me at the time and I'd say like, hey, um, can you, uh, you know, set aside whatever the ugly cucumbers or <laughs> whatever it might be because organic produce is expensive. So um, it's just kind of one of those things where you can really like kind of have to get a little creative, but uh, you can. Always feeling tired, yet I work out and sleep full eight to nine hours. Yeah, at that point, you want to look into your adrenals and get a Dutch test done because there could be just some exhaustion going on. I think it's recommended to get sunlight first thing in the morning. What if you can't? Um, then get sunlight at any point of the day that you can. Like make it a habit to maybe get outside at your lunch break and take a walk or something like that. It doesn't have to be, you know, don't focus so much on rules as much as you focus on um, just getting things in in a, in a schedule that works for you. How do I keep my gut healthy? I have a history of stomach infections. Figure out what's going on in there. Have you ever gotten a comprehensive stool analysis, like a GI map? You want to see what's going on. Is there H. pylori involved? What bacteria? What fungus is involved? There's something involved that keeps coming back and is not being dealt with. Body fat percentage for a teen girl. Um, it just really depends, but a lot of teenagers are really underweight right now um, due to the effect of social media, and they have an easier time like gaining and losing weight, and so a lot of teenagers are starving themselves. So as moms, um, if you guys are moms of teenage daughters, please make sure they're eating. Um, make sure that they are nourished um, and it's not just like, you know, you're a kid so you can eat whatever you want. No, they can't. They need to be nourished just like you are. And um, you you want to show them a healthy body uh, image and a healthy relationship with food. If they see you eating and not talking about like, oh, I'm so fat, then they'll want to eat. And um, be careful with who, I mean, I'm not trying to give advice, but like some of these girls that they're following on social media, oh my God, like I'm just like, 
oh they're like oh my god look at this is my breakfast and it's like half an apple and I'm like oh my god you know like yikes um so just be very careful with who they're following on social media who's showing them how to treat their bodies and how to eat and how to have a relationship with food and be careful what you portray because they're not just listening to you they're watching you with food and uh, if you're you know picking at your food or you're constantly on a diet they are going to pick that up and they're gonna feel like they need to constantly be on a diet so um but girls teenage girls should should have a good body fat percentage they tend to be leaner just because their metabolisms tend to be more healthy but i would say like anywhere from 25% to 30% um, is normal. Um, a lot of times when women go through or girls go through puberty, it's a little safer for them to have a little bit of a higher body fat percentage. So it just kind of depends. Um, but I wouldn't say like anything is unhealthy unless they're truly underweight, they don't have regular cycles, that kind of things. How can I contact you? Um, you can email me at the email available in my profile. Um, uh, that's the best way, or there is contact form on my website. What kind of hair products do I use? Um, I use just like pretty natural hair products. Like I'm not a big hair product person. Um, I use a Cure Organic Shampoo and Conditioner, Morocco Method products, and then I'll do like a, just apple cider vinegar rinses. Um, but yeah, that's really it. I don't really use a bunch of hair products. I really like Morocco Method uh, products. Can ovulation make you break out? Uh, yes, it totally can, because that's right before you ovulate, you're gonna have your biggest estrogen spike of your cycle. And so if you're not detoxifying really well or you have a lot of estrogen in your body, you could absolutely break out around that time. Any comments on Young Living Progestance Plus? Um, I just think it's pretty expensive and all it is is bioidentical progesterone. It's just wild yam. So it's just, in my opinion, it's like save your money. And I think it has other essential oils in it, which I'm not a huge fan of essential oils applied every single day, um, absorbing into the bloodstream unless it's very diluted. So um, I don't know. I'm not like against it. I'm pretty neutral on it. I'm not a huge fan of like uh, essential oil companies, like MLM companies in general, just because they really lie a lot they spread a lot of misinformation um but overall like if it works for you it works for you i don't think it's like a bad thing how can you get my hair to grow back naturally my doctor is useless they offer the pill yeah you've got to work on all your issues so you got to get to the root of it um usually when it comes to hair loss like hair mineral analysis is helpful a dutch test is helpful if you don't know what's going on with your hormones exactly um and sometimes a gut test if you have digestive issues is helpful you want to make sure there's no stress on the body um you have enough progesterone your estrogen is detoxifying well your testosterone is at a good level your blood sugar is balanced like you know you have to kind of go through all the things that could be driving hair loss and get those balanced and um, then the body feel will grow hair. You have talked a lot about dairy but what's the bad reputation cancer inflammation um it's just one of those things it's like a game of telephone it's the same thing where like all of a sudden now canola oil is healthy even though they have to like deodorize it and bleach it to, to make it edible um it's just one of those things where people are truly misinformed and um it, it is really run rampant i think a lot of times these industries are driven by money so when they start to realize like oh we can make a buck off of plant-based milks let's start demonizing dairy they'll do it and it's one of those things where our ancestors we have literally drank dairy for thousands of years and you're telling me at just one point we have this epiphany that all of a sudden it's causing all these issues uh no what about all the issues that are internally going on that dairy might exacerbate or that dairy might uh, make more visible on the outside just because something quote unquote is making a symptom worse doesn't mean it's causing a symptom correlation is different than causation and so um there's just a lot of misinformation a lot of people say like igf1 is present in um cancer and and dairy is very rich in igf1 and i'm like well so is meat and so is uh, carbohydrate vegetables and so is soy so like what about that you know so we're saying like oh this thing in this thing is present in cancer so therefore this thing causes cancer it's not how it works like i said correlation is not causation and in the health and wellness world there's just a lot of 
games of telephone, I like to say. It's like one study says, this may cause this might happen. And then somebody says like, oh, this causes this. And then somebody's like, this definitely causes this. And that's really what happened with dairy. It went from like, dairy has still been shown in so many studies, like in European countries that drink dairy, everyone look around, everyone is super, super lean and healthy as compared to the the um the country right next door that doesn't consume a lot of dairy and everyone is obese so it's just really interesting to say that like dairy causes cancer and inflammation yet the the countries that drink the most dairy are tend to be the most healthy and you know how the mediterranean diet got really really popular well the biggest thing that the mediterranean diet researchers omitted is that those people eat a lot of dairy, a lot of saturated fats, yet they focus so much on the olive oil and all these, all these um, uh, unsaturated fats and forgot to uh, talk about the most important part, that those people eat a ton of dairy and a ton of chocolate, both saturated fats. So it's just very interesting if you start to just dig into the truth, um, very rarely is the truth mainstream. How can I ovulate again? Uh, after years of subdermic implant, I have problems with extra hair, acne, and lost hair. I'm sorry, girl, that sucks. Um, it can take some time. You, you've really gotta work on getting the hormones balanced, getting progesterone levels up. Keep in mind that, that you know the, the implant is gonna stop ovulation altogether, so it's a high dose of estrogen, and I don't believe it has progestin in it. I'm not sure, I can't remember about the implant. I don't know if it was the implant on or what, <coughs> but, um, you really want to work on getting ovulation back and uh, the way that you're going to do that is by working on estrogen detoxification, getting androgens down, getting blood sugar balance, getting stress off the body, and really trying to get those progesterone levels up. Um, also, what about the bad reputation studies of saturated fat? What do you think? Well, a lot of the bad reputation studies of saturated fats are done on animal fats and they're not done on organic animal fats. And so what are we feeding animals these days, you guys? We're feeding them foods rich in polyunsaturated fats. Corn, soy, um, canola oil, soybean oil. Their fat has literally become corn oil or soybean oil because of what we're feeding these animals. And then they're feeding people these, like lard, for example, pork lard. It's pure polyunsaturated fats because of what the pork is eating. And so for somebody to come to me and say that, oh, all these saturated fats are so bad, what saturated fats are, are we feeding them? We're feeding them technically like um, the lard from a pig that ate soy. So their, their lard is technically soybean oil you know what I mean so it's very interesting to me but I, I believe that a lot of the saturated fat studies are done um, improperly because we're not taking into account what these animals are consuming um, and there's not very many studies to show that saturated fats are actually bad for you at all there's quite a lot of uh, that show that they're good um, or that they're neutral yet there's been this big demonization of saturated fat um, both the implanon and the nexplanon are progestin only methods. Okay, um, I would double check with that. I believe at least one of them um, are, are does have estrogen, but I could be wrong. Um, but if they're just progestin only, then your goal is to really get um, progesterone levels back up and get ovulating again. Um, at, when it comes to the implant, it shuts down the cycle completely. So there, you know, like for example, IUDs still allow ovulation to occur. Um, it just blocks implantation, whereas the implanon does not do that. It completely shuts down the cycle. So the goal would be to restore the brain to ovary connection, um, get get the body ovulating again, make sure your body is detoxifying, um, and make sure that like estrogen is moving, make sure that androgens are down. Progestin's pretty androgenic and pretty estrogenic. It doesn't really have a lot of uh, progesterone. It has some progesterone-like tendencies, but not a lot. So you just kind of want to work on getting the stress levels down, but it really depends. Like sometimes it takes a little time to get back to normal afterwards. Jess, just have to say since starting FN, my cholesterol has dropped from the 220s to 200 on my last lab work. Saturated fat is not to be feared. Woohoo! Yeah, because we know that um, high cholesterol is caused by thyroid issues. What to do with low estrogen and low testosterone on Dutch test? Um, 
I I would uh, look into DHEA levels. Is your is your DHEA good? Um, that's the first thing. Where's your cortisol at? And then where's your progesterone at? Um, sometimes those those hormones matter in comparison with what's going on with your estrogen and testosterone. What's the best brand of oregano oil supplement? Can you take continually or need breaks? I like Oregano um, by uh, North American Herb and Spice Company. It's really powerful. And uh, I do think that every supplement should be taken, given a break from. The body should really get a break every like month or so from things. But yeah, usually you can take it uh, continually. Just keep in mind that any back antibacterial or antibiotic substance, your, your, the bacteria, if your goal is like to kill bacteria, for example, um, your, your bacteria get smart and they can actually become resilient. So that's why it's better to like, if you're on candida or bacteria protocol, you wanna like rotate your herbs. Male heart afibs arrhythmias, are they a cause of mineral deficiency thoughts? Um, they can be caused by a lot of things. Sometimes it's just cortisol and adrenaline, but a lot of times it is uh, a magnesium deficiency purely. They actually know that magnesium, low magnesium can cause heart attacks. And so um, I usually, when it comes to like afibs and arrhythmias, it's usually just a magnesium deficiency or a potassium deficiency. But yeah, it, a lot of times has um, a, a a mineral deficiency uh, component and a lot of times it's magnesium oh my cholesterol and thyroid issues where can I find more info on this I'm suffering this yeah look into Ray Pete um, he really talks a lot about how uh, Keep in mind, guys, that cholesterol is the building blocks of all of our sex hormones, and it takes cholesterol, or it takes thyroid, T3, and vitamin A to turn cholesterol into pregnenolone, which then turns pregnenolone into DHEA, cortisol, and progesterone, and then DHEA is going to turn into estrogen and, progest or, and testosterone. So it is the precursor, and if you don't have enough thyroid, it's going to take more cholesterol to convert into sex hormones. So... I highly recommend checking out um, a few of my highlight stories. I have quite a bit of information on that in my thyroid series and bioidentical hormones series and um, menstrual cycle series. So uh, lots of information on my Instagram. Is Ceylon cinnamon powder in, in powder form okay? Also wanted to thank you for FN because it's first month that I had ovulation in six months. Hope to bring back menstruation. Woohoo! If you had ovulation, I hope in two weeks there's going to be a menstruation. Yay! That's so exciting. I'm so excited. Um, so Ceylon cinnamon is wonderful. It's very antibacterial. It helps with blood sugar balance and it's just delicious. So I love Ceylon cinnamon and I think it's a really great addition to, um, to, uh, the diet. Our little nest. Is it possible to have a consistent period like to the day, but not ovulating? Um, it is possible. Um, it's less likely, but it is possible because estrogen is responsible for thickening the uterine lining, and so we can still bleed without having a, 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 um, an ovulation. Is it possible to have a very, oh yeah, just saw that, a very consistent period but not ovulate? Yes. Couldn't hear the last live answer to this. A1C pre-relaxed high fat keto, 8.0 to 5.3, now 6.0 now, was feeling great on high fat, low carb. Um, yeah, I'm not really like, I, I know you already asked this again in this live, Cecilia, and I'm just not sure like what the question is. Is it worse or better? Because I'm not like um, getting the idea. I know that you said you were at 20 insulin and now you're at eight. Now you're at six. Um, you're feeling great on high fat, low carb. Um, keep in mind, we feel great on high fat, low carb a lot of the times because we're just forcing the body to burn, to, to manufacture its own glucose. And the way that it's doing that was with cortisol and adrenaline, which gives us artificial feelings of stimulation and good feelings that can only last for so long. It usually lasts about a year, sometimes less, sometimes longer, um, until we just kind of hit a wall and start to see things fall apart. So, um, I'm not really sure, like, I know that you said things that might be better or worse, but I'm not really understanding, like, what the question is. Sorry, I got my coffee. And I ran out of cream. I gotta go to the grocery store today, and oh, my coffee only has... So, like, the best coffee, in my opinion, is maple syrup and some heavy cream or half and half. But, oh, right now I'm just having maple syrup because I don't have any cream, and it's not the same. Not the same. It is definitely not the same. All right, you guys, I'll do a last call for questions. And then if I don't have any questions, then I will um, end this live and I'll save it to YouTube and save it. You can watch it for the next 24 hours. But yeah, I will, uh, last call. I really appreciate your guys' time. I know I go live a lot. It's just sometimes easier for me to just like hop on live and answer your guys' questions.
but um yeah well okay last call love you guys really appreciate your time and um i will do i don't know if you guys liked the pre-submissions if you like to pre-submit your questions i feel like it kind of is nice because it you know if nobody's asking questions then i can pull up questions that have already been asked um but if you guys like that i'll continue to do it that way uh what is an ideal diet look like Ideal nutrition looks like someone who doesn't really have many cravings because you're so nutrient, uh, you're so, so nourished, you're so nutrient, you're so nourished, meaning that you eat a, an abundance of protein, carb, and fat, so your body has the building blocks to do what it needs to do. A, a, a telltale sign that someone is not nourishing themselves well is that they're craving everything. They have no control around food. You know, if, there, if there's a plate of brownies, put in front of you, you eat the whole thing, you can't stop. Um, an ideal diet to me looks like really nourishing foods, has a good a good amount of protein, so um, high quality meats, um, dairy, if you can tolerate it, pastured eggs, shellfish, white fish, lots of good saturated fats like butter, cream, um, ghee, coconut oil, um, lots of fruits and fruit juices, broths, um, and root vegetables and a little bit of like well-cooked greens things like that if you like vegetables having some well-cooked vegetables here and there is not a problem but overall really nourishing i don't eat like a lot of other people out there i'm not a huge fan of like nuts and seeds tons and tons of beans or grains it's just very irritating to the gut and you really aren't getting a lot of nutrients from them do you think decaf coffee is okay when dealing with leaky gut? Yeah, I have no problem with coffee at all. I don't even think like if you really want caffeinated coffee, I don't think it's a problem. Also, yeah, do you have a good probiotic recommendation? Um, it really just depends on what the person's going through. I usually don't recommend probiotics unless I see someone's GI map or unless um, I know what issues someone's dealing with because not all probiotics are created equal. But I usually like um, a spore-based probiotic intermittently, like just Thrive, which you can get on Amazon, or Mega Spore Biotic, which you do have to get through a practitioner. Um, but both of those are really, really good. Sometimes one called Fluorocyst by Life Extension is good. Um, it has phage technology, so it kind of can go in and kill um, bacteria and kind of reach, uh, make the change the terrain of the gut. But overall, the fibers and the prebiotics that we eat are just as important as the probiotics that we eat. I was on iron supplements for a long time and suffered diarrhea every day. Sorry, TMI. What would cause this? I've switched to grass-fed liver capsules. Yeah, iron feeds bacteria and pathogens like nothing else. I hate iron supplements personally. Of course, I know that a lot of doctors recommend them, and I don't recommend people go against their doctor's wishes, but iron supplements are usually a horrible idea because they are just so, you know, the, the body sometimes lowers iron when there is a pathogenic infection for a reason because bacteria eat iron. The body's very smart. It's not dumb. And it's not like, oh, whoops, iron's low. Oopsie. Um, sometimes iron is low because people are not digesting or absorbing it. Some pe Sometimes iron is low um, due to other heavy metals being high. But nine times out of 10, when someone has like very bad gut issues or bacterial infections, the body has lowered iron to keep those pathogens from eating and from feeding on iron. So um, if, if uh, iron causes really bad dis digestive disruption, a lot of times it's, it's causing bacterial infections to be worse. So um, iron should never be supplemented unless a full iron panel is done, unless you see an HTMA, you know what, um, where your iron levels at or your true iron levels are at. People supplement iron willy nilly or put their kids on iron if it, without like getting tested and I just, it's heartbreaking to me, honestly. It's something that should not be taken lightly. Iron can be poisonous. Um, it's like, it's like saying like, I think I'm low in, in, um, like, you know, some type of metal. Like, I think I'm low in copper. I think I'm low in steel or I think I'm low in tin. Like it, it is necessary, but it's not necessary in high amounts if you don't need it. So it's very important to know where your iron levels are before supplementing. And uh, if, if an iron supplement is not making the issues better, there might be another reason, like a lack of absorption of iron or um, the body pushing uh, iron low because of bacterial infection, that type of thing. It's not just because the body's like, oh, I'm so dumb, like iron's just low. 
Do you know what could be causing severe muscle cramps, especially in the legs, typically worse at night? Yeah, usually magnesium deficiency. You guys have to keep in mind that minerals are kind of the spark plugs of the body, and each one has very specific purposes. A lot of times each one plays a huge role in hundreds of purposes. But we have to keep in mind that calcium and magnesium work together. Calcium is a is the mineral of contraction and tightness, and magnesium is the uh, mineral of relaxation and um, like release. So calcium is responsible for muscle contractions and cramping and magnesium is responsible for the muscle relaxation. And this is true for the gut muscles, everything. So a lot of people have too much calcium in relationship to magnesium and their muscles are contracting no problem, but relaxation is another story. And so any type of like leg cramps, muscle twitches, cramping, um, twitching, a lot of times it has to do with magnesium deficiency. Um, and in that case, that's the only thing that would help full. My doctor said my iron was at an eight, but did they test your ferritin? Did they test your iron saturation? Did they test your hair iron? You know, like you need a full iron panel. Um, it shouldn't just be one or two things that are tested. But yeah, magnesium and, um, and there are some type cases where iron is totally necessary, but I, nine times out of 10, I see it do just much more harm than good. And um, a lot of times it's an absorption issue or um, you don't have the cofactors needed to absorb iron like copper or zinc, you're deficient in those, or you need B12 to absorb iron, you know, those types of things. So a lot of doctors uh, either don't know it or they just don't practice it, I'm not really sure. But um, a lot of times if iron supplements aren't working, then there's something else at play and an iron deficiency. All right guys, last call for questions. Um, I know stuff comes in or people join, so I'll um, give uh, some time. And, uh, but yeah, I am really excited because um, I'm like picking out my my engagement ring and of course my boyfriend's not telling me like when he's gonna propose but I'm like getting all the details like situated because he's like I'm not gonna propose with something that you haven't picked out he just knows me too well because I'm gonna be like so unhappy <laughs> so I'm just like uh, picking something I'm like okay what do I want um, top tips for coming off birth control yeah, so top tips are going to be, first of all, be informed. I really like Lara Bryden's book, The Period Repair Manual. Um, everyone recommends, like, I, I will sometimes recommend Dr. Jolene Brighton's um, Beyond the Pill, but I don't really, like, I don't know. I think one is enough. Just understanding what the pill is doing so you understand the goal when coming off. Um, biggest thing is keep your blood sugar stable and pick a time that is um, gonna not be super stressful. So like some people just want to quit and they quit at the time when they know they're gonna get lack of sleep, they're not gonna be, you know, they're gonna be at the busiest time of their season or whatever it is. Don't do that. Make sure you pick a time that is the best. Um, and uh, you really want to be low stress first of all. Second of all, you want to keep blood sugar balanced. So you want to make sure you're eating enough. You're not over exercising. You're taking care of yourself. And um, you want to make sure you're replacing the nutrients that you lost. So vitamin C, vitamin E, B vitamins are a big one. B vitamins are super important. Um, sometimes zinc and selenium are, are minerals that are lost. So kind of be educated on that and the period repair manual will educate you on that. Um, and then overall, just don't stress about it. Take care of your body and you can only do so much and only focus on the things you can control and don't focus on the things you can't control. Finally, yeah, I know, I know. I've been, tr I tried on rings a while ago and I finally like decided on what I want. <laughs> That's just me, it takes 18 years for me to decide. But I love you guys, and um, I'll text you, Miriam, because I haven't texted you back. And it makes me feel guilty. But I see a lot of these uh, yellow profiles, which I love. Okay, what are your thoughts on spirulina? Um, my thoughts on spirulina are that it tastes disgusting, like the devil's piss. Um, but if you like it, I, I don't see a problem with it. I think it can be, you know, helpful in certain cases. It is, like, very detoxifying. It has... Um, good amount of minerals like sodium and potassium in it but I'm not like ooh, it's a superfood or like oh it's necessary um, it can be helpful but it's not like I don't think people need to waste a bunch of their money on it 
All right, guys, I'm going to shut it down, but this will be saved. You can rewatch it, and I'll see you guys soon.